All right, bacteria in ecosystems. Remember, use your highlighter or pen to underline important information. Remember, bacteria all about recycling, often called saprotrophs. That same basic thing is decomposer, right? But you also had detritivore in there as vocab. You know, decomposers that eat, physically eat it and ingest it, goes in their body. Okay, important role in recycling. Live on organically, digest, absorb some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so mode of nutrition. Remember, autotrophs, you know, photosynthesis. Consumers. Um, that, you know, is taking in, you know, outside nutrition. You know, having to eat things. Saprotrophs, eating dead stuff externally is what they're really going here. They're, they absorb some of the molecules. They live on the waste. So saprotrophs. Remember, detritivores, they're going to be eating things like worms, coyote, coyotes, uh, uh, vultures. California condor, which is coming back. So remember, remember the pyramid of energy. There's always way more at the bottom. Way more energy here than here. So you'll see that huge step down. Remember, only 10% of the energy is moving through, you know, on to the next level. So you're always going to have, um, you know, the bottom being pretty big and the top being pretty small. So let me put it down a little bit. Oh, no doubt that much though. <laughs> uh, okay, hopefully this. Okay, so the question, what does X represent? That's the producers at the bottom. Uh, photosynthesis, right? Um, remember, that's what all of our terrestrial ecosystems are based on for the most part, unless it's some kind of a hot spring situation. So producers, and then I have a label, you know, primary consumer, secondary consumer, 90% of energy loss. So you start with a thousand, you go up to a hundred and ten, and then one, the very top. So letter X, um, that's producers. So here, testing your knowledge of our main phyla, mollusks, you know, like clams and cuttlefish and squid and octopus and platyhelminthes, flatworms, be distinguished. So mollusks definitely have a mouth and an anus. Platyhelminthes, it comes in one side, it goes out that same side. So if that's if you're for us, it'd be if your feces came back out of your mouth, um, which sounds pretty nasty, but um, you know, these small molecules or small, small organisms, they just have a different body structure, different lifestyle. So just review, we have this also on the last exam, the, the basic characteristics of arthropoda, cnidarians, periphera, annelida, and then don't forget about the plants. Okay, there's four bryophytes, mosses, phyllocinophyta, which I think of ferns, F for the ferns, um, coniferophyta, that's that's a C O N, um, conifers, which would be you know pine trees for the most part, and then angiospermophyta. Oh, I, I wrote it better here, sorry. <laughs> Anything with flowers, and they dominate, dominate the plant world. Mm, flowers just bought a bunch for Mother's Day covered my bases <laughs> um, yes angio I love angiosperms because I love flowers love them. 
tulips, I think one of my favorites. Um, there we go. So desert plants have to conserve water. Maybe you, some of you guys saw, I uh, went to the desert garden at the, um, at the Huntington, but if they have no leaves, um, there's less surface area that the stem is green. But remember, not all, some desert plants do have leaves. Um, but leaves are, you know, high surface area. So you can have a high. High does not have an E on it. What am I thinking? High rate of transpiration because of that. Um, loading organic compounds that's not going to conserve water um, uh, remember desert, desert plants don't want to accumulate salt um, and then growing long hair uh, on the surface so air, remember they don't absorb moisture on on those hairs and remember plants are very cool they can they can grow um, get taller, build new parts, you know, throughout their life, these meristems. So it's the meristems, the root meristem and then the apical stems and roots. Um, apical meristem, you know, at the very top. I told you that story how the plants in my backyard grew once I built something next to them. How do angiospermophyta, these flowering plants, improve sexual reproductive success? They use mutualistic pollinators. Now, mutualism means both benefit. So the bee gets a nice meal, um, plus the plant gets to you know, switch up its genes. So you have two benefits for both organisms. Um, Micro propagation, that's a, that's a human, you know, um, humans have to do that. It's asexual. Um, whether it's short, uh, sorry, a long day or a short day, you know, they have a strategy that, you know, improves their success. Uh, remember, plants want to flower different times of the year, and that dictates they need to keep track of, you know, the the sunlight so that's how they make sure not everything blooms in April you got things blooming from you know whenever even in the winter time there's there's winter blooming plants all through the summer you hike up in the mountains any time of the year usually except you know dead of winter you're gonna see some flowering so to which domain you know which is the largest you know largest category and our domains, eukaryote, and then we have RK bacteria, and we have U bacteria. Those are our three domains. So eukaryotes, things like us, regular bacteria, um, you know, that lives in your mouth or on your skin, that'd be U bacteria, then archaebacteria, these are things that live in hot springs that are um, adapted for very extreme conditions. So a shark would definitely be, um, in terms of which domain would be a eukaryote. Okay, it is a consumer. Okay, um, is it a fish? And it is a fish. Chondrichthys. Uh, I just get they're a special kind of fish because they don't have bones, right? They have just a cartilaginous skeleton. Um, we think of bones. Trout, salmon, those sorts of things. They, they have an actual, you know, they have actual bones. So here we go. Oh yeah, I, I kind of wrote it out here. You've seen those pictures of Yellowstone National Park, all those beautiful colors in the pools or in those hot springs. That's because of the archaea bacteria. All right, so we have a frog and a rabbit. The evolutionary relationship. Of these. See how, see how similar. 
Um, the femur is, this is the leg bone. Like, um, this is, you know, the, uh, the lower leg bone here. And those are homologous, okay? Um, they have a close evolutionary relationship between, you know, frogs and uh, rabbits, these vertebr uh, vertebrates, how they um, evolved uh, from one another. Remember, analogous are very set, very different. Good example of that that I always like to use is insect wings and bird wings. Those are analogous um, structures. Let's see, how can we evolve bacterial resistance? Um, variation within one genome confers resistance, so, so that is correct. Um, antibiotics do not enable genes on them, their own. They just give a situation where some genes are favored, but the bacteria or the antibiotic itself doesn't do the enabling, so not for that. And incomplete doses of antibiotics allow those ones that are pretty resistant to survive and reproduce. So in the small intestine, again, kind of reviewing our monosaccharides, disaccharides, polysaccharides. Um, Amylase from the pancreas digests that starch down into the glu to individual glucose molecules so it can be absorbed. So remember, small intestine was is where most of the absorption is happening. Pepsin is um, introduced in the stomach, and that helps it break down the proteins and get all of your Basically, all of the enzymes are working um, in your small intestine uh, to break everything down into the monomers. Remember, it's all about the monomers. And have the monomers to be absorbed. To be absorbed. All right. So surface area is really important for a whole lot of things. And this is... Um, in this example, we're talking about um, the kidney here. So reabsorption of glucose in the proximal convoluted tubule. You have um, a lot of surface area from a very um, twisty, um, very thin, twisty tube. And that's also what makes the kidneys delicate organs sensitive to blood pressure problems, high blood pressure, um, any sensitive small sensitive blood vessel can be damaged you know more easily which you also have in your eye so people with diabetes or high blood pressure um, can suffer from the, that damage to those two organs so yeah reabsorption of glucose remember you lose glucose in ultra filtration and then um, you need to reabsorb you don't want to lose you shouldn't have any should not have any sugar in the kidneys um, Surfactants, you know, those are in your lungs. Surfactants, um, that helps keep the lung from like sticking to each, to each other, to itself. Okay. Um, so they didn't always know how the, you know, the heart works and the arteries. But one thing that they did was when they took animals and they tied up the arteries, the heart swelled up um, because the blood was being backed up. So this made them think, oh, it must be the heart that's pumping through the body. I think that was Harvey that did that. Um, probably a little unethical. Remember, ethics and experimentation, that was a work in project. Pro work in progress even up till today. It's only been really the last 50, 60 years they've actually had some actual rules. Uh, comparison arteries and veins. Arteries, high, high pressure. Veins, low pressure. Remember, your pulmonary arteries kind of switch that around. Um, arteries, it's your vena cava that do that. Um, they do have thick walls. Veins don't have permeable walls. That's the capillaries. Okay. And remember that 
bit of trivia about the pulmonary artery and vein for at your lungs. For uh, penicillin, um, it acts, and most antibiotics act on the biology of bacteria themselves. So um, that's good because if it's targeting things that um, mechanisms that only bacteria use, that means it's going to kill them and not you because you don't want to be killed um, by the drug you're taking. An exception to that would be chemotherapy. That's basically killing your cells. Hopefully the ones that have cancer. And if you kill enough of the ones with cancer, hopefully your body will um, become cancer free. So penicillin, it, it specifically knocks out the metabolic capacity of the, pen, of the, uh, the bacteria so it dies. Um, uh, well, I'm sorry. The viruses, since viruses don't live in, if viruses live in bacteria, then killing those bacteria would knock them back. But remember, viruses in, infect your own cells. So you can't take antibiotics. You know, antibiotics kill bacteria, not viruses. Okay. Uh, yeah, Watson and, and Crick, remember, they, they were the D DNA structured people, along with Rosalind Franklin. You got the Rosalind down there. Remember her x ray image helped them solve critical to help them solve the, the puzzle of what DNA looked like. So controlling muscle contraction, calcium frees the actin filaments and myosin heads to attack. Remember it shifts the tropomyosin off those um, myosin heads so the actin, I'm sorry, off the actin so the myosin heads can join and then and create that sliding action. Um, that creates muscle contraction and movement. Okay, so review, um, review muscle contraction. All right, so let's see what can produce antibodies. So this is this is the steps, right? T cells activate the B cells, and then you have clones, and then you have um, plasma cells, and the the antibody. The antibodies come from these plasma cells. Sometimes they're called B cells, though. They're a type of B cell. Um, and then these memory cells go on, help in the future. Now, this is what, when you have a vaccine, this is what you're trying to do. Create these memory cells. And create these antibodies, float around, ready to go, if um, you get infected. So it's not the clone of the memory cells, remember it's those, it's those plasma cells. Plasma cells make antibodies, I got it right there. And the last one, number 40, seminiferous tubule, remember we're in the testes, so these were making sperm. And you see these are the new sperm here being produced. Um, Leydig cells, right here is a Leydig cell. And that helps to uh, nourish these sperm. These sperm are so tiny, teeny tiny, they don't have enough organelles really to, to manage. So these Leydig cells are like their uh, um, helper to keep get you know, what they need. Oh, so letter X, we see, uh, remember in our gametes, we do have um, my meiosis happening and that is a separation of homologous chromosomes, right? We go from 46 to 23, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing that separating of those homologous chromosomes. That's what we're having. That's what we're doing in our uh, gametes. So that is those three videos um, give you all the background for higher level 2016.